Good morning, everyone. I just want to wish you all a happy Memorial Day weekend. I know it's one of those weird things because uh, it's not really on Sunday or Saturday, it's on Monday. So, and for all of you that have served in the military, we thank you because we know that freedom isn't free. And for all of those who gave their lives to protect our freedoms, um, they, they're due our respect and our remembrances. So, so now, you, now you can remember why you got that day off if you have one off. Well, it's good to see you guys here today. What a beautiful day it's going to be. Yes. You should have seen it raining uh, like at midnight last night, though. It's like bullets. I had my sunroof open. Big mistake. <laughs> That's right. Unplanned car wash. That's what it was. It's fine. I closed it in time, which is good. I was able to save my, uh, save my pants. So <laughs> my shoes were done. But Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful thing it is to be free in you. Because you have come that you've demonstrated your love for us and that while we were still sinners in rebellion against you and hating you, that you died on the cross for us. Lord, you demonstrate your love towards us all the time. We will always be in awe of it. We will always be growing in the knowledge of it. I pray that you might help us, Lord, as we look into your word now, that we would give it the gravity and the honor in which it's due. That as we see it, we might see ourselves and you, and how it is that we should be. I pray that you might make our hearts receptive to what you might speak to each one of us personally as we hear these words today, as we look at the ministry of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to submit our lives in every respect that we would give you our undying love and our undistracted attention. So, Lord, this is our prayer. Pour out your spirit on us, Lord, that we might know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome back to the book of Mark. We're going to finish up chapter 10. It's uh, the third of, of three messages in chapter 10. Jesus is going to do something remarkable. He's going to heal a blind man as he's going through. Jesus never has an arbitrary reason for doing what he does. Have you noticed that? Amen. It might seem so on the face, but in hindsight, it's always like, oh, I get it now. We're going to see one such little sequence here of three unrelated, uh, on, on first view things that Jesus does. And he's going to teach us something, I hope, about spiritual blindness how many of you know what spiritual blindness is? Yeah, I hope you know it not experientially presently. I hope you know it as it's a past event. But not having an understanding as to even what right and wrong is, just having your own code of morality of what you understand right and wrong is, is spiritual blindness because we don't see things from God's point of view. We put ourselves on the throne, make ourselves God, and make up our own laws. And that's typically what most human beings do. But spiritual blindness comes in part because we harden our hearts when the Lord speaks, which is why it's so important that when you hear his voice, that you don't harden your hearts as they did in the wilderness. When the Jews were out in the wilderness, we have to make sure that we maintain a listening ear and a soft heart to God's promises and his premises. Amen. Amen. All right. So with that, Jesus is going to heal a blind man. I'm, I'm, it's the spoiler alert. And gee, I'm pressing. Here we go. I'm pressing again. You know when you're having one of those days? This is one of those days for me. Previously at Grace, we were going through chapter 10, and we looked at Jesus' teaching on divorce. 
We looked at all of uh, the contingencies and how they tried to stump Jesus with these questions. You know, can, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? And uh, there were some rabbis that said yes, and there were some rabbis that said only for sexual immorality. And Jesus sided and said, no, it's only for sexual immorality. But divorce was not something God created. God created one man, one woman for life. And so we talked about divorce and what all that looks like and how devastating it can be. Um, I came out of a family that was divorced. It caused me a lot of uh, a, a lot of pain that I find ways to deal with. Uh, praise God, Jesus was the answer ultimately. And then last week we looked at the parable of the rich young ruler. First of all, Jesus has some children around him, and the disciples are trying to keep the children away from Jesus. Hey, he's a celebrity after all, and so they have to keep the children away because he's on important mission here. And we're his people, and you know, we're not going to let anybody get close to him because, you know, something could happen. <laughs> like something would happen to Jesus. Isn't that funny? That's like us trying to tell God things. You know, hey, I just wanted to let you know because maybe you didn't know. <laughs> you ever catch yourself doing that? Like, Lord, I don't know if you know, but it's okay because Ananias in the Bible did the same thing. He was told, there's a man named Paul, and he's over this house, and I want you to go. Because I've given him a vision of somebody named Ananias coming over and putting his hands on his eyes and healing him. And he goes, oh, Lord, I know this guy. He's, he's caused a lot of trouble for your people. You can't possibly mean that. So we're in good company when we do that. We looked at the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus, and he comes quickly and he bows at his feet and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? How do I get in on what you're doing? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God's good. He's already undermining his whole question because this guy thought he was good. And he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. There's only one. He was already trying to give this guy an opportunity to confess, but he didn't do it. And then he begins to speak to him. He says, well, you know what the commandments say. You know, do not murder, do not steal, honor your father and mother. And he raffles off some of the easier ones. He could have went with number one or number 10 and blew him out of the water, but he didn't. And, and he says, well, these I have all done since I was a youth. <laughs> As though he's innocent of ever doing anything wrong. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Don't miss his motive. And he says, there's just one thing. There's just one more thing you need to do. And he's like, all right, you got my attention. What is it? He goes, leave all your possessions, sell them, give it to the poor, and then come and take up your cross and follow me, and you'll have treasure in heaven. He wasn't such a happy camper. <laughs> And it says that he turned around and he went away from Jesus and he went away sad. Jesus begins to tell us that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about using a blender. He's making a metaphor. It was, it was actually said of an elephant. It's put it like putting an elephant through the eye of a needle. Uh, it's like when we say in Jersey, you can't get there from here. It's a saying that it doesn't mean literal. So the disciples said, well, then if they can't make it, then who can make it? I mean, the rich are the ones who are blessed by God because they're doing all the right things, right? Yeah. Not necessarily. Have you seen our Congress? <laughs> you know, by the way, they're all rich people. Yeah. We voted in a bunch of rich people. Get some poor people in there. I'll bet you some changes. Anyway. Dependence and independence. When we're completely independent from God, then we're just dependent upon ourselves. And sometimes that works out really well, but only for a very short period of time until we go to meet the Lord. And then we're in deep trouble because then we'll need him, won't we? So this week at Grace, we're going to go further into chapter 10. And we're going to look at this spiritual blindness. Verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 32. 
Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was going before them and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And then he took the 12 again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Now this might sound like deja vu all over again, but Jesus has been telling them. In fact, this is the third time he takes his disciples aside and he's going to tell them what's going to happen. Jesus is approaching Jerusalem for the last time. This is the week in which he will get arrested, crucified, buried. And the following week he will rise from the dead. So as he's going to Jerusalem, he's very aware that there's going to be a lot of things going on in this week. And he knows this is his last week on earth in his physical body as he was. And so he's walking on ahead of the disciples. And it says that they were amazed. Imagine this, you're walking with Jesus, you're used to walking with Jesus. And if you know anything about what that's like, everyone has a question. You, you don't believe me. <laughs> I can tell you Sunday is one of the busiest days of my week. And I come here and I see people and they're like, hi, 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 hi. I got a question. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, what do you got? Oh, well, no, no, no. It's a, it's a big question. You, you, don't, you don't have time. <laughs> no, I got time. What do you got? Well, in, in Ezra, you know, the, then I know it's a big question. You know, <laughs> They go, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, you know, I know it's a big question then, you know, but sometimes people think it's a big question and it's usually not. But I tend to get a lot of people that ask questions and they try to find me and say, you know, I, I, I just need a minute of your time. I always worry about those people. <laughs> it's never a minute with you, you know, it's just not. And I just see Jesus with his disciples always teaching, always talking, them asking challenging questions them bringing up the current news and Jesus giving his take on it. All of these things, always Jesus, but not in this case. Jesus is walking ahead of them. So what they see is the back of his head. And they were amazed because Jesus's pace was such that you'd think he, was, he had an appointment and you're running late. Jesus knew he was going to the cross and he wasn't dragging his feet. He wasn't postponing it. He was walking briskly toward it. And he was ahead of the disciples. And for maybe the first time, they're like, this is new. You know how when you're walking with somebody and suddenly you, you just realize that they're not keeping pace with you and they're like way behind? <laughs> I see Jesus walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed. He, he knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And look how fast he's walking. I don't know about you, but I, I tend to procrastinate things. Do you, are you like me? You know, oh, I got to do that thing, you know. Well, oh, look, the shiny thing. Let me go <laughs> over there. You know, oh, I got to answer this email. Oh, look, YouTube. You can get distracted very easily when you don't want to do something. I think they were amazed because Jesus was walking head on into what was going to happen. We get a bit of an insight from the Old Testament, a prophecy concerning Christ. Isaiah 50 verses 5 to 7 says, The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me. Sound familiar? and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. Does that sound familiar? I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Does that sound familiar? For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. I believe Jesus set his sights on what he had to do. And he's like, I know what's coming. Let's go. Amen. Let's get it done. That is a man. That is my God. Amen. That's the one I want to be like. Amen. We've got to do this thing. Let's get to it. Amen. You know, it might hurt. It, it might be an absolute tragedy to everybody else around me, but I'm going to set my face like Flint and get this thing done. So, whatever you've been procrastinating, 
It's nothing as big as this. And if I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, and I believe that's true, well, then I will take Jesus as my example and I will lean into those things and not run away. And behold, we were going up to Jerusalem and the son of, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. Isn't it interesting? Jesus is speaking in the third person. Did you notice that? He. He doesn't say me. He didn't say I. It's interesting. Jesus is speaking of himself in the third person. And the interesting thing is, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. He's, this is the third time he's telling them, and they still didn't get it. It says that they remembered that he told them these things while he was, while he was walking with them. They remembered afterwards. I mean, don't you want to have a memory of something that's going to happen as opposed to looking back on something that already happened that you were warned of and you didn't understand? Boy, that's a... These guys just weren't listening. And I don't know why... But, you know, the only way that we're going to know anything is if God enlightens our minds anyway, right? So I would advise you to be always in prayer about, Lord, enlighten my mind. Help me to understand you more. Help me to understand your word. Help me to understand what you want me to do with this piece of information or, or this situation or this relationship. It's, it's hugely important because we can miss it just like the disciples did. And Jesus said it exactly right and exactly in order. He'll be handed to the chief priests. He went to Annas first, and he went to Caiaphas. So he went to the, the uh, off-duty high priest, and then he went to the real high priest. And then the scribes were there, and they condemned him to death, and they gave him to the Gentiles. The prophecy that Jesus would die by crucifixion is an amazing thing in and of itself, because crucifixion isn't a way for a Jew to die. Stoning is a way for a Jew to die. But somewhere in Jesus' adolescence, Rome took away the ability for the Jews to prosecute people to the point of death. And they took that away from them because they were misusing it. And they were just killing people they didn't like, like Jesus. And so they took it away from them. And so God used even that weird little quirky thing to fulfill the word that Jesus would be crucified on a Roman cross which is not something the Romans invented, but they definitely perfected it. So he says, this is what's going to happen. So heads up. Jesus is telling them that there's not going to be a resurrection unless there's a crucifixion. I find that to be a principle in my own life. There's no such thing as, you know, I went, I bought a lottery ticket, I scratched it off. I won $8 billion. That doesn't happen. You may dream of it happening. And after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, maybe you'll say, maybe he was right. There is no resurrection without a crucifixion. And very often it has to happen in our own lives personally, doesn't it? It's like learning by falling down. You learn you don't want to fall down because... I remember when I fell down. Jesus is informing them that it's not going to be glory days. It's not going to be, I'm going to go into Jerusalem, arise, come into the throne of David and sit there and proclaim myself king, kick the Romans out, and we're going to set up our whole administration. It'll be wonderful. You see, the Jews had this expectation that the Messiah would do this. The disciples had this expectation that Jesus would do this. And he has to stop them on the road as they're pilgrimaging, takes them aside and says, guys, I'm going to tell you again. And I'm glad he didn't say that because it sounds kind of pedantic, like you're talking down to somebody. Guys, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests, to the scribes, to the Gentiles, and they're going to crucify me on a cross. I'm going to die. But on the third day, I will raise. And I can see their faces going, what? They just didn't get it. 
And then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, I always love how they give the father's name. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> no, that's it's actually how it's written. You shouldn't laugh because I know you pray this way. Lord, I want you to do what I'm going to ask. Oh, no laughing. Okay. <laughs> and do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? It's interesting. Jesus asks a question he already knows the answer to. And they said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. Jesus just told them, I'm going to Jerusalem with you guys. I'm going to get crucified, hung on a cross. I'm going to die, but I'll come back in three days. Hey, we got a question. What's in it for us? Is that incredibly insensitive? They, see, they didn't get it. I, I love the Bible. It's an honest book. There's, there's no man that would write this book that makes men look so bad. And it's actually worse than this. Matthew gives us the full story and kind of uncovers the worst of it. It says, then the mother of the Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on right hand and another on the left in your kingdom. They didn't even ask him. It was their mom. <laughs> Mommy came and pinched hit for the boys. These are the sons of thunder. You remember these guys, James and John. <laughs> hey, mom, he'll listen to you. So you have to understand who their mom is. Their mom, her name is Salome. Salome is the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So it's a family thing going on here. And always, 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 like when they went on to the Mount of Transfiguration, there were three James and John and Peter. This is a very obvious power play against Peter. They cut Peter out of this. Said, we want, we want positions of power. We want to be celebrities. We want to be able to do whatever we want. We want you to do it for us. Wow. And yet, sometimes we pray that way, don't we? Lord, I want you to do this. He's like, well, have you considered this in the Bible, what I wrote here for you to understand how to pray? But I want you to do this. <laughs> we get that way, don't we? Yes. We don't necessarily take instruction. We give instruction, which is funny when you're not in the middle of getting caught at it. Power, privilege, and position are gifts given that are received and not taken. Power isn't something that should be taken. It's something that should be given and something that should be received with humility. Amen? Amen. Many of you who have had probably people, authority figures in your life who have misused their power and authority. I don't know about you, but when I'm driving down the road and I see a police officer, it doesn't matter how fast I'm going. <laughs> I slow down. And I go under the speed limit. And you say, well, why is that, Pastor Dave? <laughs> that little sports car of yours a little too fast? No, it's because I'm afraid that the person sitting in that car might misuse their authority. Right. And isn't that what gives officers a bad name? Yeah. Isn't that what gives armies bad names? Isn't that what gives anybody who's in a position of authority a bad name is when they misuse that authority and they're not there to serve the people, they're there for the people to serve them. And so I, I find this thing, if, if you have influence, if you have position or power, that is granted to you by God, regardless of whoever hired you and put you in that place, regardless of what man might say about that place, God has placed you there. It's his placement, not your earning. You see, it's really hard to make a resume after a sermon like this because, well, I want to say all these great things about myself to get the next job, right? 
Any of you make up a resume? Any of you know what the heck a resume is? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, because you seem far away this morning. How do you make a resume without patting yourself on the back? I would advise you get a big stack of recommendations. Get people who know you to write letters about you. And let it be from someone else that they hear it, not you. Because that's what the Bible says. It says, if there is to be praise of you, let it be of another man's lips and not your own. Amen. So I could tell you where I worked and what I did, and then I'd like to give you a stack, <laughs> if you got time, of what other people say about me. Wouldn't that make an impression if you were in HR hiring people? <laughs> Absolutely. These guys are trying to play the world's game of self-promotion. Any of you go on YouTube or you know, any of those things on? By golly, if you're not promoting yourself, then you're missing out because you could have 8 billion people and be rich overnight. <laughs> the way of our world is self-promotion. It's patting yourself on the back till your arm dislocates. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but when I hear that, even if you watch something and at the end of it they say, follow me. <laughs> Click below and you can follow me. Listen, I'm following Jesus. I'm too busy. Self-promotion is something that these guys think is going to get them a seat on the right and left hand of Jesus as he comes into his kingdom because they still believe, regardless of what he just told them, that they're going to go into Jerusalem and get set up the administration. They just totally didn't listen at all. You wonder why Jesus finds a blind man and heals him. Because it's a whole lot easier to do that than to give sight to the blind like these guys. I'm sorry. I just see myself in these guys. I'm, I'm beating myself up this morning. We can be faithful and humble servants or we can be self-involved manipulators. These guys, and, and I'm going to meet them one day. These guys are self-serving manipulators right now. This is like a, a real serious narcissistic move, right? It's completely all about them getting positions of power and prestige. They want to be celebrities. They want to have power. These are the guys that went into town to find a place for Jesus and nobody there wanted to, to house Jesus. And they come back and they said, Lord, they don't want you there. You want us to call down, you know, fire from heaven like Elijah did? Devour the town? Let me at them. Yeah, you want these guys to have power. You want these guys to be in positions of authority, right? Somebody, I could see them being judges on American Idol. You know? You know, first note, you're done. <laughs> okay. What else you got? <laughs> People walking in for an interview. Okay, what do you do? Well, I play piano. Ah, had enough of those. <laughs> Yeah, put those people in positions of power and authority. That'd be great, right? Jesus knows better. So we can either be faithful and humble with what God gives to us, or we can be manipulators. And you can smell it, can't you? You see somebody in passing and you say, so how you doing? Well, you know, I'm doing pretty good. Let me tell you about myself for the next 30 minutes. Um, uh... Yesterday was a banner day for me. I mean, I made $1,000 with one phone call. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> made it happen. Oh, and that's not even the best news. Uh, let me tell you something else about me. Eh, what is that? <sighs> we have that, don't we? And without the Spirit of God in our hearts, that's who we'd be. Yep. And they throw themselves into getting their mom. Mom, go talk to him. He'll listen to you. Good. They won't even face Jesus themselves. <sighs> Beware of taking power because you, you really don't know what you're asking for when you do that. In Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, we're told, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. So don't let a lot of things be done with selfish ambition, right? Let nothing 
be done in selfish ambition. Well, pastor, are you saying that ambition is bad? No, ambition is good if your ambition is given to you by God. If it's selfish ambition, it's evil. Well, I mean, what's wrong with being rich and having a helicopter? Did the Lord tell you you need one of those? Well, you know, he leaves certain things up to me. Oh, really? Okay. Good luck with that. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, which is self above others. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, which of course is natural, but also the interests of others. Now there's a tattoo. If you want to get a tattoo or a bumper sticker, there's one. That way you can constantly remind yourself, put it right here. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. I, I don't know about you, but I need reminders like that. That's why I read the Bible daily. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And they said to him, we're able. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism that I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. By the way, it means for those whom it's already prepared. The tense of the Greek. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. I love these little understatements. When the ten who were in spectatorship of this looked at each other, they probably wanted to wring their necks, right? Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are exalting yourselves up above us? <laughs> Wish I thought of it first. <laughs> Yay me. You see, that's what they're doing. And Jesus is telling them, it's, it's not like this. It's not about you. It's, it's not about what you want. It's not about power and prestige and position and celebrity. They got it all wrong. Look at me, look at me. It's all about me. Why don't you say something about me? And that's the way we are, right? Because this is how the world works. And it's those people that rise to the top of the food chain, so to speak. But Jesus doesn't work that way. And he's trying to explain to them, it doesn't work that way in my kingdom. A couple of things that we can do to make sure we don't run into this mistake Number one, be informed. Jesus said, listen, it's not mine to do. Like, if you're going to ask somebody for a favor, you better make sure that they're already eligible to do it, right? And they're asking Jesus to do something that Jesus isn't going to do and that he isn't, he, he's not uh, the one who's going to do that. They're already prepared in advance. And they're not thinking about anybody but themselves. And you know what you want to do? You want to count the cost because Jesus said, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I have? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Jesus is going to drink the wrath of God on behalf of you. Jesus said, are you able to do that? Well, you've got to be a sinless lamb to be able to do that. And only Jesus can. Can you be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Can you be filled with the Spirit of God in the way that I am? Or can you be completely immersed into the life that I'm living? Do you think you can do that? You see, that's the cost of that power and prestige and position. You have to be humble to the nth degree. And only Jesus could do that, right? So are you able to do what it takes to get that position, that place, that gift? You know, a lot of people want to do that. And Jesus wants them to check their ego because what did they say? Are you able to do that? Absolutely. Okay, well, tell me five ways in which you're going to do it. Well, I, uh, well, I don't know. I'll just figure it out when I get there. Okay, it's great. I, I had a person come up to me one time, the uh, first time they came here, and said, yeah, this is my name. Here's my card. 
I just figured, uh, you know, I, I, I came here, I want to spend some time with your people, so uh, if you let me speak this morning. <laughs> this really happened. He's not here right now. <laughs> what I encouraged him to do was stick around and listen and maybe learn something. It would have been good if he was here today. And see if you come one more week. See what happens there. We get, we get people, very ambitious people that come in and they want to take, put me to work, man. Give me something to do. Well, you know, I noticed the bathroom's a little out of sorts. Could you handle that? Oh, well, uh, you know, I'm not really gifted <laughs> in that area. Oh, you don't have one of those at home then. <laughs> you have no experience with that, I see. See, people want positions, but they don't want the work that's entitled. Jesus said, are you able to drink the cup and be baptized? Are you going to be qualified to be able to have this position? They didn't care if they were qualified. They just wanted it. But be careful because, you know, you might be able to get a job, but then you're going to have to do the job. Maybe you could get the job. Maybe you could lie on your resume. Maybe you could make it look inflated and you can get the job, but can you do the job? That's a completely different thing. You can do it if God calls you to it, but if God hasn't called you to it, it will be a spanking. It will be a lesson learned. And of course, no cutting in line. You know, there are other people who have those places of right and left of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're kind of like cutting in line assuming that you are more equipped or uh, worthy of that position. That's assuming a whole lot, isn't it? Amen. And we don't put ourselves in this place. God does. And so that's why I don't, I don't worry about people anymore who come in and say, you know, Pastor, I really feel like a message in my heart. I'd like to talk to your people today. That's funny because the Lord didn't call me and tell me that. Because you see, I, I too have a relationship. And it's funny he didn't mention that to me. I usually like a heads up. And he's pretty good about that. He didn't tell me about you. So that was me being kind. <laughs> you know, our best example is still Jesus of how to do this. Jesus is still the one in Philippians 2, 5 to 13. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. He poured himself into a human body and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. Did you know that there are those under the earth? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You see, Jesus stepped down and humbled himself. Therefore, God exalted him. When you exalt yourself, God will humble you. When you humble yourself, God will exalt you. It's, it's a simple mathematical thing. Humility is not deprecation, but an honest assessment based on revealed truth. I put that together and now I'm sorry it's so wordy. It's not beating yourself up. You know, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I like your shirt. You go, oh, this old thing. Did, did, you, did you get your hair cut? I mean, you, you look good today. Well, what does that mean? I didn't look good yesterday. We have all these weird things about us where we can't take a compliment and, and receive it with grace. You know, we, we get all twisted up. And we don't know what to say. Well, do I receive a compliment? I don't know. I feel funny about that. Somebody says, hey, it was a good sermon today, pastor. Heck yeah, it was. <laughs> You're not right. 
make sure you tell all your friends. <laughs> we got a YouTube channel, you know? You can have your fill of me. I'm sorry. It just, I feel like I need a shower now. <laughs> Self-deprecation, beating yourself up and speaking lower of yourself than you know is true, is not humility. The scripture says this. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You see, truth should be the deal. If somebody said to me, Dave, you look skinny. <coughs> you need an optometrist, my friend. I'm tipping scales at 225, so you, you don't know skinny. <laughs> I'll show you some skinny, but it ain't going to be on me. Maybe my wrist. Not even my wrist. Honesty. Honesty. Don't think more of yourself than you ought to, but with your, with your judgment, being sober, think of yourself honestly. Like, I am not a runner. You guys know this, right? You do something terrible and you run away from me, I, I might wave. <laughs> Unless you were close, then I have some hope because I can sprint, but I, I, long distance isn't going to happen. So I'm glad I'm not a police officer. But I can do some things, just like you can do some things. God has gifted you with certain things. And if you speak down about those things, you're speaking down about a God-given gift. So be careful. Don't think of yourself more highly of yourself than you ought to, but consider yourself with sober judgment. James and John in our story haven't done that. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think the disciples were so unhappy? <laughs> they heard it and they were greatly displeased. Why do you think they were displeased? When you see somebody else self-promoting themselves and you get ticked off about it, what does that say about your heart? If somebody is self-promoting and trying to do something, oh man, I'm so full of stories. You see a single man having a conversation with a single woman. And you look and you go, nope, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> He's making overtures and, you know, like the peacock with the feathers out. <laughs> and you're going, that is, that is not going to happen. I, like, I, I sit and I watch and I take note and I say, God, help me never to be like that guy. And you just say, that, that just isn't going to work. I don't get upset. I don't get angry. Hey, hey, cut it out, man. Unless it's my wife. <laughs> Unless I should be the one doing that. You see, I think the other disciples had the same heart. I think they had the same spirit. That's why they were upset that James and John thought of it before they did. The disciples weren't so far different than us, were they? And the, the whole idea of this is I want to look in my heart and make sure there's none of that. Right? You don't want any of that in your life. You don't want any of that in your heart, right? Mm -hmm. The self-promoting, me, look at me, like, ew. <laughs> but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, now Jesus stops everything. He says, guys, come, bring it in. <laughs> we got to have a conversation here. Because there's now disunity, isn't there, among the twelve? Jesus called them to himself and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you. It's like not in my house, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said, whoever wants to be great has to be the servant of all. Could you see the 10 disciples saying, you know, my feet are a little dirty, John. Why don't you get on that? Right? Hey, James, this backpack's a little heavy. Why don't you carry this for me? You want to be greatest, right? Here you go. I, brothers do this. I don't know if you've had brothers, but brothers tend to be very much like this, at least the ones in Jersey. Uh, an interesting quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson picking up on this, a great man is always willing to be little. Amen. A great person is always willing to be little. And, it's, and you might think that you're a good servant, but when someone treats you like one, that's the test. When someone treats you like a servant, that will be the true test of your heart. And I notice myself sometimes, I have a problem with that. God help me. You know what a pyramid scheme is? Yeah. Any of you involved in a pyramid scheme? Yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> Here's a pyramid scheme. Pyramid scheme is this. You've got the CEO at the top, and you've got the president and the vice president, and then you have the upper level management that's in there. And then you have employees down on the bottom rung of this pyramid. This is a pyramid scheme. Maybe not in a traditional sense like you thought. The interesting thing is Jesus takes it and turns it upside down. And he says, if you're going to be the greatest, you need to be the servant of all. You don't sit on top of people. You support people. Good leaders are not measured by how many are under them, but by how many they carry. Amen. You see, that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. So the question is, how many people are you carrying? That determines greatness, not how many people you're sitting on top of. When you go to a pastor's conference, you know, the pastors, it's like, oh, so, so where are you pastoring? I'm, I'm pastoring in, in Middletown, New Jersey. Oh, yeah. How many people? How big is your church? How many people you got? Well, that was quick. You don't even know my name. <laughs> you can ask how many people are at my church. First of all, it's the Lord's church, really. And do I count myself as a member of that church? You know, I, I get all technical and stuff in my head. And usually I just say, well, it depends on the day. <laughs> if it's a nice day, there are less people. Or if it's a rainy day, there are less people. Do you see what they're doing is they're taking a worldly way of gauging how important you are mm -hmm. on how much respect you should be given, on where in, in the competition you fall. Mm -hmm. And it's utterly worldly. I know that I need to do everything that I do for an audience of one. Amen. And that's the most important thing. So Jesus tells them, you saw what these guys did? That's not the way it's going to be here in my house. You want to be the greatest, you be the servant of all. You be the lowest person. You be the person that does everything. And you don't stand on top of people. You stand under them and support them. Now they came to Jericho. And he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, uh, with a great multitude, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So they go into Jericho. They're on their way out of Jericho and they're approaching where Jesus is going to be crucified. And there's a blind man on the side of the road and he hears it's Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, somehow he heard about Jesus. He heard about the miracles. He heard about who he is, not just what he did, because he calls him by a messianic name. He says, son of David. How did he know his lineage? Because this man knows the Bible. The son of David is the prophesied name of the Messiah that he would come out of the root of Jesse. 
that he would be of the line of David and the Messiah would come. He's calling Jesus the Messiah. He's not just saying Jesus of Nazareth like that's his first and last name. And he says, How, has, have mercy on me. This is blind faith. It's kind of a joke. Sorry you missed it. The guy's blind and he has faith in somebody he's never met and in somebody he's never seen. That's blind faith. But isn't it good? And isn't it right? Because he knows who Jesus is and that's all he needs. And he cries out to him as he's on the road. And many of them warned him to be quiet. <laughs> Shh, quiet. Sit down. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, the disciples are playing the celebrity game. Here comes Jesus and we're with him. <laughs> you see, just the more you look, the more you see and you're like, eh. The children wanted to come to Jesus. No, no, stand back. He's very busy. They did this in the previous chapter. And Jesus rebuked them. He says, let the little children come to me because such is the kingdom of God. In fact, if you don't become a little child, you're not going to make it. Wow, okay. Here, go see Jesus. I don't care. <laughs> then they get through Jericho, and there's a blind man crying out to Jesus. And they're like, hey, hey, old man, sit down. Sit down. Quiet. Shh. You, you, you're making a fuss here. Don't make a scene. Don't make me cuff you. <laughs> So they warned him, and Jesus stood still. He stopped dead in his tracks and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. <laughs> I read this book as a drama, okay? <laughs> hey, 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 shh, quiet, quiet, quiet. Jesus said, bring him here. Oh, hey, take heart. Jesus has called you. Come on. No, no, you're, you're one of us because he said so. So, you know, come on in. Wow, could you imagine going to their church? They stop you at the door. I'm sorry, do you have a reservation? <laughs> you know, we have to be really careful that our hearts don't go that direction. God help us. So he suddenly got VIP status and was ushered into the presence of Jesus. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? What do you guys think? Is this a necessary question? A blind guy calling out and calling him Messiah is now running to him. He needs somebody to bring him to Jesus because he can't see him. And he gets before Jesus and says, yes, what can I do for you? I just had a question. No, he doesn't have a question. He wants to be healed of his blindness, right? Is that obvious? Then why did Jesus ask the obvious question? Jesus is inviting a confession. What do you want me to do for you? I'm blind. I'm helpless without you. And you're the only one that can fill my need. He's inviting a confession. This is a picture of salvation, people. There was a time when you were blind. And you cried out to the Son of God and recognized him as the Messiah. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? I want to get saved, Lord. I want to be a new person. I don't want to be the person I am. I want to be another person, the person that you promised in the Bible I could be. He invites confession. That's why we have to confess. I'm a sinner, and I can't help myself. I need your help. I need a Savior. What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, which is the personal word for rabbi. He doesn't call him rabbi, which is just like teacher but Rabboni is my teacher, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Amen. And 
immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Jesus didn't spit on anything. He didn't touch him. He didn't do anything. He just said, you want to be healed? You're healed. Because Jesus can do that. He speaks the word and it's done. He spoke the words into, the world's into existence. Certainly he can speak salvation to us and eyesight. So suddenly he's healed. Jesus inviting a confession and he says, I want you to restore my sight. And he says, you got it. Easier to heal a man who's physically blind than to open the eyes of his own disciples as to what's going on. That's a lesson for me. It should be a lesson for you as well. Amen. And the natural response to his healing is that he follows Jesus. He already threw his coat off, right? It's what he would use normally at night to cover up like a blanket, and that's where he lived. So it's like he threw his tent off. You see the faith he has as he approaches Jesus? He knows that Jesus is going to do it because Jesus called him. I wonder if we would have such faith. We who get to know the Lord Jesus Christ sometimes take him for granted and forget where we once were. We were blind, and now we see. We were lost. Now we're found. Amen. That carries with it an obligation to follow in the steps of Jesus and a privilege. Next week, we're going to be in Mark 11. A story of fruitlessness. It's actually the day that Jesus cursed. That's right. That's exactly what I was looking for. I was like, oh. Yes, Jesus curses. If you, if you see the picture and you know the scripture, you already know what it is. So I won't ruin it. I'm gonna I hope that the Lord has spoken to your heart about some of these things. That he may have opened up your eyes, just as he did blind Bartimaeus.